Is it live? Wait, oh. There we go, I can hear it. Alright. Music. You can hear the music. You can hear me. You might be here in church. Because I live next to a church. And almost at the end. We are this weird remix I use for this. Hello and welcome to Movie Crap Live. Oh, how's it going? Been a bit of a crazy night to get here, but I'm glad if you are here. Uh, anyway, hello to, first off, Rand Sand Film. It has been a while. Jordan Salafalo, Sin Ram, Cornbread, K Master, Super Dusky. I don't know, I've cornbread, I don't forgot if I said it before, but cornbread deserves twice. Uh, Nathaniel Foga, Ashley R, Ashley R, yes, hey, hey, I, Jordan Salafalo, Purple Goop, not plausible. I think I said everyone. I will send out the tweet, cornbread, thank you. And, and we have the first super chat. Joker 2 looks cool, but okay, I'll, hold on, hold on. First off, let's switch over. Hello, we're in the Jaws shirt. Crazy night. Already, but before we do any of that, let's look at a little guy named Chris Will Renzi, artist Zodberg. Okay, so you know, I sent out a tweet and I'm like, guess, guess the energy drink. And, and usually I know what the energy drink is, and apparently I didn't because this has been sitting in the back of my fridge for like a little bit. So it is actually, I have apologies to Cornbread because he won my guess. But I was incorrect. First time, I think that's happened, and I got the Sour Patch Kids apparently <laughs> Red Berry. So, so inaccurate um, tweeting there. However, Black Sox Winkle said, and I'll open it up. Joker 2 looks good, but Paul Bart 3 musical went. Exactly. Exactly. What is Kevin James even doing with his fucking life? Except making that. All right. Cheers to you. It was alright. I think I prefer Swedish fish, but I think in my mind I grabbed Swedish fish. That's not what actually happened. Um, I'm glad you like the Shadow of the Hedgehog image. Man, so many... Sorry it's on a Friday. I hope that's cool with everybody. Um, that's honestly just because uh, my wife has gone out and I thought, well, I'll do a stream when put the kids to bed and do it early and then they kept waking up and it was kind of a kind of kind of kind of the last hour was like wow I wish I hadn't scheduled this <laughs> hey Gary what is up so it was a uh, yeah I don't know everything's fine the show's ready script wise and stuff but um, I want it in my head when I was playing this will be a 10 I'll be like I'm gonna start this at 9 45 like early i'm gonna surprise everybody and that just didn't happen so oh well um let's see anything this has been a cool week since last show um i took sophie to godzilla king kong and that was cool we have a review together which will be out next week um hype hype uh oh no problem gary that was a cool episode i realize i haven't watched a bunch of of falling upwards and i'm trying to need to catch up anyway it's a cool show man if you ever need a voice hit me up i don't think you do but you know um uh yeah that was fun the only thing that was kind of our first like more grown-up movie because it is pg-13 and it is more for the um not just hello al vasquez hold on not just for the uh let's move this a little okay closer to me there we go not just for the kiddos and the trailers were all movies that are pg-13 or r and she was so fucking bored and then while we're watching it suddenly um <laughs> what was it um challenge a challengers trailer comes out and i was just like looking at it like come on fucking hollywood give me a break challengers but she was just bored uh despite it's um you know apparently like zendaya said all the sex scenes are implied which i don't, I don't know if that's true um However, uh, it was a good time. She had her first uh, Godzilla theater experience. Um, so that was cool. And we watched, 
I think I told you last time we watched the first one. We watched the second one. She really loves that little girl, so that was fun. Um, um, oh, a guy named Crystal. I'm excited for this cartoon. Let me know when it premieres. I would love to watch it. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, the so I tweeted last week because everyone's tweeting about Conan, and I was like, um, about Pierre. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Pierre Bernard, Recliner of Rage, and I was tweeting about. I was like, I wish this guy had a YouTube channel, and like we heard about him, and he he responded and was like, I do have a YouTube channel, and I have this and stuff, and so uh, check it out through my Twitter. It's cool that Pierre Bernard, Recliner of Rage, lives on. I was like, what happened to that guy? And apparently, he he makes some cool art. It's that was actually pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't. You know what? This is always the part I prepare the least for, which is probably bad to start the show this way. But, um, uh, yeah, just a, uh, another week of getting stuff out. I guess I'll just talk about videos that came out and then um, we'll move on to the actual show. Uh, it was a productive week. Um, I'm actually glad I moved the show from Wednesday because there was like some family health stuff I had to deal with. And like I, I was like, man, I am... I'm so glad I didn't have to like cancel and figure, you know, so pre I preempted, I did it before that. And I'm like, I'm kind of glad I did. Uh, but, um, oh, and I saw Ripley. Sorry. I saw the Ripley show. That's really cool. I'm going to do a short about that. Uh, that has it maybe on Sunday. We'll see. Um, and I'm going to have a video tomorrow, but, um, of this week, since last time, I forget all of them, but, but this week, uh, the, what was usually the dot dot dance or the strong bad dance video which I re-release as a short, I actually had the regular video, which has been on YouTube for like 17 years or something, and um, was on cleavesfees.com, and it hits its 20th anniversary this year. I'm not really sure when the release date is because it came out in so many different forms in 2004. Um, actually had its biggest day ever. Um, like... Uh, this week believe it or not of all, its whole time on youtube it's done okay and all that stuff but it's like individual day more people watched it when i gave it a throwback than had watched it in a single day ever before so that was kind of crazy i was like so the biggest this short ever got was 20 years later so if anything if you're ever like do i need to hang on to this or people want to watch you know still want to watch this old thing it's it's good to hold on to your content because uh uh uh, it's good to hold on because you never know. Um, also the, uh, what was it? Um, the, the, you know, I put out, was it X-Men and what's the other thing? Anyway. Um, and, oh yes. Andy Merrill. I was going to talk about Andy Merrill actually doing the show. Andy Merrill did respond to one of my tweets and that was really cool. And seeing, learning about Andy Merrill has been cool. Uh, I, f oh, I put out, was Ghostbusters last week, I think. What was before X-Men? I don't even remember. Was it Smiling Friends? Anyway. Um, but I put out uh, the X-Men season one finally. At first I was a little bummed about the reception. Because I wanted it obviously to do really well. Because I worked on it really hard and stuff. But now uh, it seems to just be trickling in. So, um, Oh, Yuki-san. Sorry. Yuki-san. Finally, I finally did that. But... Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting, that one. Because I was kind of like, oh, man, I really liked uh, making the season videos. And I was, like, kind of bummed. But I, I kind of think I need to be patient with those. Because I was going to... Originally, I was, like, getting kind of sad about it. I was like, man, that I really worked hard. But, like, any time I click on it, it just keeps very slowly increasing. So I am already working on season two. So um, we'll see. I Sometimes you got to be... Um, patient with your stuff because i was i was a little like maybe people aren't because i actually liked i was like i wouldn't mind doing more season stuff and doing the other x-men shows so we'll see if, if you haven't checked that out anyway uh the other throwback was shrek 2 i think someone in the chat last time said you should do that for a throwback and i was like you know what i think they're right uh might do some spider-mans next week and stuff like that um i have some other stuff brewing um oh i have a movie <laughs> I just realized I had a um, movie review winners for Patreon that need to go out this morning, but this morning was a little crazy. So that'll come out later tonight. 
if you are a patron as well as I'm going to, well, I'll tell more about that later. Um, I, sorry. You know what? Let's move on. Let's just get into the show. Cause I can't think of, man. Yeah. I'm a little bleh. Okay. Let's drink some water and get into this. I don't think there's anything else I need to talk about. Is there? No. All right. Let's just, let's fuck it. I, uh, Let's just get into the show. Sorry. <laughs> cool things are happening. Let's just set it that way. Okay. So this and everything I do is supported by you. GSU. No, you, the fans. Uh, either through Super Chats during the show where I will drink for to the um, Sour Patch energy drink ghost thing or whatever. Um, or on my Patreon, which I have all sorts of cool stuff like uh, postcards, which will be going out next week. Movie review votes, which the winners will come t t tonight, I think. Uh, uh, exclusive content like my commentary series. Early videos if they're done early. Also, if you are a patron, there is going to be a DVD giveaway. I'm going to give away DVDs of mine that I kept that I don't really want, but I figure you guys will want. I'm actually going to test those DVDs. Um this weekend to make sure they work because I know DVD rot's such a thing. But so if you are a patron, I will have ones for certain tiers and I'm going to figure all that out. Um, but if you are a patron, you can win uh, one of the DVDs I have. Uh, I will post pictures of them and figure out the rules within the next week. But if you are a patron, that's a, a cool thing that I am doing. Um, oh, playing Helldivers, sp spreading democracy. I don't know what the fuck that means, but Good for you. I've been playing some some Mario Kart and uh, man, Bone was it Bone Bowser? Bone Dry Bowser is my guy. I love Dry Bowser on a motorcycle with big wheels. That's my shit right there. Anyway, it's like Starship Troopers. I hope in a good way. Anyway, cheers to you, Austin. Um, so. I will be doing that DVD good giveaway, but it helps me do all sorts of things like everything from, you know, uh, everything, you know, keep the channel going, keep me be able to make, you know, publicize the channel, do things with the channel, help pay bills, uh, keep, you know, it's rough out there. So just keeping the roof over my head and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it financially helps me to continue be able to make YouTube videos and all those things if you're financially able to do so. If not, just give a like to this video. All uh, That's always very much appreciated. Uh, it always helps to give a like to uh, this, to, sorry, uh, give a like or just to watch or subscribe. You get all sorts of cool stuff like you find out about the throwbacks. You find out about... Uh, when the stream is going to be actually <laughs> and all sorts of cool stuff like that so um if you're into this stuff and want to get hit up about those things uh do so um but uh if you're financially able to contribute something i very much appreciate it uh if you are not that is cool just watching uh i appreciate you being here as well as the discord has all sorts of cool stuff which i think tomorrow they're doing a watch along with something i'm not sure uh, what it is, but they're doing something. They also have cool uh, channels in there, like the licensed playing card channel. I almost lost these in the last week, um, and I found them again. So these are holding on to dear life, these terrible Back to the Future cards. But um, there's other things like Ask Jim. There's the movie news channel. There's General, where I ask the morning before a movie crap, like, what do you want me to talk about tonight? There's all sorts of cool stuff. It is a great community. If you like the chat here and you like... Um, uh, sorry... If, if, sorry, if you like the community here in the chat and you're like, man, Jim's always talking to these people. I'd love to hang out with these people. You can anytime you want on the Discord. It's a great community. I highly recommend it. Recommend it. Link below. As well as I have a TikTok, which for some reason when I post TikTok stories, it insists on having a song. I don't understand that and I can't turn it off sometimes. Whatever. I have a, t <laughs> I have a TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram personal and reels and a Tumblr and all those things are in the links below if you would like to follow me on any of those platforms. Thank you. Let's get into it. Fuck this. Let's get into the biggest 
This is the biggest, this is the story I care about the most. The thing that I was like, oh shit, this has changed my movie going thing. This this has made this summer even bigger. This has made movies more alive than I could possibly imagine. And that is that Furiosa has a 15 minute action sequence that took 200 stunt people, 78 days to shoot. And it's very, uh, it's apparently the most important thing. It, this is like a real quote. It is very important for understanding Anna Taylor Joy's character. Now, since it didn't say Furiosa, I understand this to be something as an expression of herself and we will fully understand her as an actress. Um, or they actually just mean Furiosa and this writer describes things stupid. But either way, this sounds the most amazing thing ever. It took them 78 days. That is longer than two months. It is the epicness of watching all these people. George Miller, the guy who did an action sequence in the first Mad Max where he said, don't eat anything because if I have to perform surgery on you... <laughs> It'll be a lot easier. That's true. Um, George Miller is an insane man. This is the craziness. This is the, the the insanity of George Miller filmmaking on display. Don't put out any trailers. Just put out crazy on-set nonsense that happened on the set of Furiosa. This is the shit that I need right now. Come on. I was like, will Furiosa be as good as Mad Max? Uh, is Fury Road or the other best Mad Max? I don't even give a shit. There are no other movies. There is just Furiosa. This is the greatest thing that I have heard all day for movies at least. It is insane. This this is the thing right here. Anyway, so moving on to other news. I will bring this up several times in the show because it is the most amazing thing. No one can stop me. <laughs> This is my new stop motion that Furiosa. I'm going to come back to that. Anyway, so Quentin Tarantino. Ugh, I had a lot of caffeine tonight. All right. Quentin Tarantino was going to make a movie called The Movie Critic. Up until a couple days ago where he canceled it out of the blue. Um, so, uh... No, we can trust this. Joel Silver is not George Miller. How dare you? How dare you, Sin Ram? How dare you? Anyway, for shame. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so Quentin Tarantino was going to do his final movie. He has to make 10 movies and then he's out in a very outdated uh, view on how he views cinema and arts. And uh, uh, where am I getting the Furiosa thing? It was on Games Radar. It was a... Um, uh, here I will post the link, but it was it, it was an interview with the producer actually of Fury Road and George Miller. So let's anyway, okay. So Tarantino announced that he has canceled his final film, or supposedly fine tenth and final film, the movie critic. Um, what do we know? What was going on with this? Supposedly this was going through various drafts. Originally it was. There was kind of like the thing with Tarantino is, uh, is like he, he, a lot of people are saying this, but he says shit. And in fact, I don't trust his movie announcements until they roll the, the cameras roll for the most part. And I think, um, uh, that's sort of what happened because we got the first reports were oh it was woman was based on Pauline Kael or something. Then we hear it's based on a critic he used to read in a porno magazine, and then we heard Cliff Booth was involved, and there's rumors Tom Cruise was going to be a part, and there are all the other big actors from Tarantino's career. And I think the thing with this is, ultimately, um. Is that I think this was a stupid idea to say this is his final movie. Because as much as I like I have um, you know, I, I think about this a lot with people like Kiss said their farewell tour and I think it's lasted for twenty years or something. And there's certain people who do that. And I used to use the Jay Z thing, but I think the black album might be the best Jay Z album. Um But I think that he I think overthinks this because it is his final thing. And part of me thinks what he really should do is say, I'll probably make more. I don't know. But 
you know, this is a, this is a culmination of something, but it is not sort of the end. And I think that would probably be a better way to do it. I don't think you should really announce retirement unless you're Warren Zevon and you're fucking dying. Cause that's what he did. He was dying and he like, his was like, well, I'm like dying of like, he was dying of like a huge cancer thing. Anyway, the Thanos focus said dead. Dang. Can't believe Tarantino would do Doug Walker like that. That's true. I heard that rumor that it was between Doug Walker and AVGN and Doug Walker won and he got the role. He was going to be the movie critic. Everybody knows that it was going to be potentially the most horrible thing anyone's ever seen. It was going to be better. I'm going to say this right now and I, I'm kind of saying it. I think it was going to be better than the, the review of the wall. I think we, we could all tell. I think we were all thinking it. It was going to be better than nostalgia critics wall review. Cheers to you, Nathan Foga. Um, but I also think, I mean, I think the thing with the latter part of a director's career, which Tarantino was like, no director makes their best stuff later. I think like that is something you think when you think of the big ones, you think of your Jaws, your Taxi Driver, your, um, you know, even John Ford was stage or stagecoach and stuff like that. But here's the thing about that. And I really actually want to break this down because I think it's fucking dumb. Um, or like Miyazaki, I don't think The Bird and the Heron is his best movie at all. Is anyone going to be claiming that? But at the same time, I think certain later directors make some of their most interesting work. I William Wellman, who's a director I think you all know that I really like, made this film Track of the Cat, which I still think about because he basically made a black and white film shot with color. Like he, he lit it as a black and white film, but like had certain colors pop. It's cinematography wise really interesting. And he was doing some interesting auteur stuff. It was a little bit ahead of its time. Um, same with like, I think Scorsese, like I think Killers of the Flower Moon is one of his better, like better films of this era. I think Silence is incredibly interesting. Um, I think a lot of people, I don't agree with Wolf of Wall Street being on the top tier, but a lot of people do actually feel that way. I think with Spielberg, like things like Tintin or The Post, like he's done some interesting work. Yeah, they're kind of just going through motions on certain ones, but like even Spike Lee with Black Klansman, I would put up there. It is not as exciting and as surprising as their first efforts, but they're still doing interesting work. And certain directors like John Ford, Stagecoach, not Stagecoach, The Searchers was at the end. Like, name me, and I'm serious about this, Name me a more acclaimed Western than The Searchers. Like, it is always in the top five, if not the number one. John Ford is the most influential Hollywood director ever. He has four Best Director Oscars. So, I claim bullshit if you're saying that you can't have your best movie at the end because The Searchers is 100% John Ford's best movie. Like, there's very few people who disagree with me. And even, I think, towards the end, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance constantly gets huge acclaim so anyone and i'm saying i'm gonna like this is he's john fucking ford i get that hitchcock 70s stuff isn't as good but like psycho was the guy started in the silent era psycho is 63 like guy went from before comics was invented to amazing spider-man basically and and then made psycho like you can't that's like 50 years like so anyone who's saying that they have they have a very limited view of art and what artists can do. There are plenty of directors who, you know, even the guy who made uh, I Am Not a Negro, that was his, like, he'd been making movies for, like, 40 years. So I think that um, this is a really outdated thing. It's an outdated view on art. Um, I, I just, I, I kind of hate it. And I also sort of feel like Tarantino, I have this weird, oh, anyway, I'll, Zane Paris says Tarantino is dying of boredom, probably. Cheers to you. Um, I I think um, I think the thing with Tarantino is when he started, I was starting to get into movies. When he put out a movie, I would go through that movie and pick out every movie that he referenced and see all of them, and it was like an obsession. Kill Bill was like the worst one. I think it was like eighty movies he referenced or something, and I saw as many as I could find, but. The thing with this is, I notice as it goes on, he's not picking the obscure movies. Like, Hateful Eight is like a Bonanza episode, and John Carpenter's the thing. Django, I'd actually already seen the Sergio Corbucci movies. Um, 
I, I so it, like I know it was a Sergio Corbucci riff. I didn't actually see the Australian westerns, which I know he references in that. Um, but it like in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like I, you know, I'd seen I knew that era fairly well. So I do feel like what once for a lot of us was this guy who had all these cool movie recommendations doesn't have that anymore and we're sort of seeing his age as his taste doesn't feel like it evolves he's just very good at using that taste and i kind of feel like that's what's happening where he is hitting this wall because he's very obsessed with the 70s he's very good at that but like scorsese is not doing the same references he did on mean streets spielberg is not doing the same references well miss spielberg is spielberg but, <laughs> but like a lot of these people adjust and i feel like maybe that's part of Anyway, I'm sorry to rant about that. It sort of bugs me. Sometimes. But it is pretty abrupt. I know he canceled Hateful Eight and then went back to it. I wouldn't be surprised if he's kind of revisiting things. It sounds like he wants to bring Cliff Booth back. Uh, Brad Pitt's character. There's other rumors he also wants DiCaprio. But DiCaprio is sort of a hard person to schedule because he doesn't like to do a ton of movies. Because he's DiCaprio, he doesn't need to. Um, I'd be curious what it is he does. Part of me thinks he should just... What will happen is one of two things. He will write a different movie. No, three things. He will either write a completely different movie and it will happen. The second thing is this will just happen eventually and it'll be like how Inglorious Bastards you kept hearing about different versions and this will happen. Or three, this will be like Chinese democracy and he will hold this over us for like 10 fucking years and then when it comes out, it won't be as good. It'll be funnier to have made jokes about it. And we're sort of like, this should have come out 10 years ago. And I don't see, I think it's one of those three scenarios. Anyway, I, I don't know. I hope it's good. I would like it to be good. I was actually thinking today, I was like, whenever it does get announced with a release date, I would like to do a review series of all the Tarantino stuff. Um, uh, but I, I think the 10 movie thing's stupid. Like either, to me, it's like, I think it's honestly better to make your your body of work stop and have the public um demand that you come back like missy elliott or is someone who like stop making albums people are like what happened to missy elliott and that's like feel like works out better legacy wise if you were like what happened to that person then oh yeah they had this weird thing and it's like anyway i i agree with uh dan he should make an anime film that'd be sick all right so, um, I saw, I think it was Cornbread, and a couple of you will ask me why I bring up the Avatar, the last, the Aang, the last Airbender release date move. Um, because I think it's sort of being reported wrong, at least by the, uh, is it called the cartoon community anymore? I don't even know. The people are reading into it, and I kind of wanted to break it down and like, I'm not saying their, their theories are like based on like people were fired from the Avatar studios and stuff. I don't think that's incorrect, but they're seeing this as like they're getting rid of Avatar is is incorrect. So here's the deal: you have basically, and, and this goes into the Wild Robot as well. We had the trailer for Transformers One, which um, I can just talk about that now. I guess uh, I thought was fine. I think the biggest problem with it is you have Optimus Prime and Megatron. And the idea is they're friends now and they'll become enemies later. I got no indication from that trailer how they would be enemies. Like if they had an adversarially friendship, it just felt like they're buddies and somebody trips the other one. And like, I don't know, I hate you forever now. It like didn't really make a lot of sense. But um, so they announced the release date. It had been, uh, it basically got, what is it? Pushed back, moves back, Transformers moved back a week supposedly they weren't they were pretty close to one another so originally uh transformers was supposed to come out on september 30th coming out on september 20th and avatar was originally supposed to come out on october 10th now here's the thing is avatar and transformers same studio as paramount you're basically using the same publicity department for two movies and they're, ba they're kind of like animated action films. And if they both bomb in the same time, every studio is going to be like, oh, we know it doesn't fucking work. And it wouldn't be necessarily the studio's fault that they're overusing uh, a certain department stuff. So to me, it's the publicity people who are like, I can't do two 
action animated films that are probably going to be PG at the same time, you're going to eat into each other's audience no matter. I mean, they're not too far apart. Like they're going to eat into each other's audience. There's no doubt about that. So it just like makes a lot of sense financially and as a business organization to move one of them. And I kind of think um, Avatar being in January is a smarter move than Transformers being in September. Because Transformers being in September, you can have it bomb and be like, oh, we sold a lot of toys, whatever, who cares? But with Avatar um, or Ang the Last Airbender, you know that audience is going to show up. You know that cult following is going to show up. And as we talk about with January, if you have an audience that's ready to go, you can make some money because there's no competition. And it's actually really helping the box office than it's hurting it. So I think I understand when you hear January... People, you know, I get Red Litter Media made that joke, fuck you, it's January, even though it's like the industry has changed so much since that meme came out that like we really shouldn't, we really should stop doing it. Like, it's like, I get like before COVID, yes. Post COVID, they're just like, like, I'm trying to feed my family right now. Could you not joke about fuck you, it's January? Like we put the fucking Mean Girls movie that was supposed to go to streaming in theaters because because people just <laughs> didn't want more theaters to close like it's a little it's, it's less fuck you it's january it's like i'm going to freeze to fucking death oh my god it's january that's that's what it should be called so this is actually probably good for the theaters it's good for the fan base they'll probably get more show times the the kids who want to see both will have enough space in between there's usually not a lot of camp competition animation wise by that time in january i think it is a much smarter move for avatar will it make as much i mean i think they're both dead times so it's like september is probably a little worse because um the the problem is i i mean september is sort of like a lull time anyway for people buying stuff so i i just don't see that happening but um i think uh it's it's a much better move for um avatar um transformers I'm curious about this one. I think it is much more for the kiddos. And I think with uh, Transformers... Sorry if I went too hard there. Uh, it, with Transformers, I think it is trying to appeal to the kids. And I think the older fan base will have notes about that, I guess. But um, I think if, you do, if you're unwilling to let the kids get into Transformers and have fun with this, you're essentially asking the franchise to die with you. And that's something that um, I think if you are... That's, that's something that... I don't think that company wants or Transformers, I think, could live on past that. So I am curious about how they're going to sell the friendship breaking up and how they'll establish that because that I didn't get from that trailer. I actually thought it was like a good trailer for a fun animated film. But for the plot, I thought it was actually kind of a bad trailer because it was like, I just don't see how they'd break up right now. I don't get it. Like, you really got to sell this. So we'll see. Um, the other factor in this is Wild Robot, which at this time is coming out on the same day as Transformers. I do not see that staying. And I think after, uh, didn't Transformers 1 played in space or something? So a lot of aliens are going to come down, obviously, for that. No, um, but I think Wild Robot is an ambitious animated film. I'm not sure if it doesn't have dialogue, but it's weirder and stranger. If I was DreamWorks, to me, it plays more like an awards play. I would play it at the beginning of December where I don't know the release calendar now but if you put it out then like what happened with Godzilla minus one and the boy and the heron like dominating because J December is a weird month because the first couple weeks post Thanksgiving they just expect the Thanksgiving movies to sort of just like roll up until Chris until the Christmas movies show up so that's how you got like minus one in the Blaine Heron like dominating the box office because there was nothing like there. So I could see Wild Robot doing well in that spot. I don't think Wild Robot's going to do a ton of money, but it could do well in a slot like that. Or they'll push it back a year, which I think is actually highly possible. But I thought Wild Robot looks really good. I think it sucks that um, it's getting hit that badly. That. So um I want to do a thing. There's this article about aging auteurs. But before we read that, Mad Max the prequel Furiosa has a 15 minute action sequence that took 200 stunt people, 78 days to shoot. And it's very important for understanding Anna Taylor Joy's character, Furiosa, in the movie Furiosa. This is the biggest event we have seen in movie history. Apparently, Anna Taylor Joy still doesn't have a driver's license, just like me, despite. 
having to do a J-turn. What is a J-turn? I don't know because I don't drive. But she knows because she did stunt school. That's amazing. It's a 15-minute action sequence that took 78 days to film. Okay, anyway. Um, so Scorsese is finally making... Sorry, I'm going to do this. I really think that is the coolest. <laughs> Uh, this is my declining mental health is hearing about Furious a lot. All right. Martin Scorsese is finally making. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like I'm going to lose everybody by doing this dumb, dumb bit. If you, <laughs> if you give me a super chat that says do it again, I will do it again. Um, so we have this article about the aging auteurs, which is basically just about Scorsese and Spielberg. Uh, I guess. Um, um, so Scorsese is finally looks like is trying to make his Sinatra film after his Jesus film. He's been trying to make the Sinatra film forever. If you looked at his um, uh, my my video was like Scorsese films. He almost directed the Sinatra thing is a movie he's been trying to make forever. I remember uh, access. <laughs> Stop my shit. Access Hollywood uh, covered it a lot. Like a lot of the press was like, is Scorsese going to make it? But the Sinatra estate is always stopping him. However, he cast DiCaprio as um, Frank Sinatra, which he's previously done 10 or so years ago or even earlier than that. And then uh, Jennifer Lawrence as Ava Gardner um, as well as I guess they're doing that period of his life. I sort of don't think the Sinatra thing would happen but um i do think i would like him to i think if there's going to be a sinatra movie um martin scorsese should be the one to direct it i think he could make the best sinatra movie he probably maybe that's what the sinatra f family is worried about because martin scorsese doesn't make flattering portrayals of people and i i'm imagining that they will uh not be happy about what he would do with it but at the same time like if you really want a movie that lasts was sinatra's legacy i would do scorsese but it's interesting this it's really been the um the the family and the estate that has blocked this for so long it seems like i mean scorsese has these projects like gangs of new york was for 20 years like last temptation was for a while um silence was for a while that he just keeps going at and it seems like he's definitely doing his jesus thing um, which apparently wants Andrew Garfield for again, which is interesting. Andrew Garfield's like his religious actor uh, for his religious movies. But I, I think the Sinatra DiCaprio thing, like a lot of people said he's doing this because he wants, of course, he likes a big budget, especially right now. And you get that with DiCaprio and you get that with Jennifer Lawrence. I, I think like it would work with all of them. Apparently they all have the same manager so uh it's uh, supposedly it was looked at as like his agent was like this this would be a huge movie if we do it this way and they were like okay let's do it um i i i i'm kind of curious about that so we'll see the other thing is spielberg apparently is developing a ufo movie written by david kemp david kemp is the guy who wrote the screenplay to jurassic park and is even writing the one for the new jurassic world jurassic park franchise that they're starting so um David Kemp is a very good screenwriter. I think he also wrote one of the credit screeners for Spider-Man. Right? I think so. Um, he, uh, I don't know. It. I'm curious about that. I also think Spielberg, I'll give you this with Spielberg, is, okay, he has E.T. that's fairly famous. I don't think people realize that Close Encounters... Um, sort of reinvented the whole UFO thing in terms of movies and TV. Like, the X-Files wouldn't be that way. Because he basically took... He was always interested in UFOs, but he took the UFO thing and combined it with a um, uh, post-Watergate environment. So to me, that he wants to revisit it, I think would be uh, actually interesting, like how he would modernize it. Because he is the one who, like... Without Close Encounters, there wouldn't be an X-Files. How we understand... Um, Aliens today is because the idea that Spielberg came up with in Close Encounters. So I'm actually, it's sort of like if Spielberg was like, I'm going to make another shark movie. I'd be like, holy shit. So I think this deserves a little more hype than it's getting necessarily. And if you look at like, that's how he contextualizes aliens. Because if you look at War, War of the Worlds, which is a 9-11 thing, like he takes aliens and recontextualize them for the era they're in. Um, if I was him, 
my one point of this is Vast of Night was one of the more interesting Spielberg riffs and is a good movie. I was a little harsh on it, even though I liked it in my review. But Vast of Night is really cool. It's on Prime. I, if I was him, I would have David Kemp write his script. He's a great screenwriter. No notes there. But I would have those guys actually give notes on David Kemp's script. And I would at least have a lunch with the Vast of Night guys. I think that would be a smart move for him. Anyway, so this is the part of the show everyone's saying the woody allen sound would be good should i not bring up furio how about this anyone tell me if i shouldn't do the furios a bit again i'm not doing it right now or no i'm not if everyone really hates it i just think it's funny because i legitimately think it's cool all right two seth mcfarland stories in a row seth mcfarland says family guy will never ever end ever because there's no reason for it to um I do, like, I post this on Twitter that Family Guy and the Simpsons are in a game of chicken. <laughs> and, and they're just, like, driving at each other, but we don't know how long the road is. And that's basically how I feel about it. It's like, sh- the Simpsons should have 100% ended a while ago. Family Guy probably too. And they're just like, they're like, no, I refuse. And even South Park, they're, like, completely refusing. I sort of think if I'm them, all three of these guys, my thing with this is, there's this comic strip called Doonesbury. Very, um, very influential for the baby boomers and stuff. It has like no cultural impact anymore because it went on too long and it didn't actually get to meet up with the next generation. I think part of that is because it became kind of toothless and Boondocks came in. And uh, Boondocks was a real watershed moment for comic strips. Like if you were political before Boondocks um, and 9-11, like that, that was sort of like, like, you don't look so political right now. Let's let's put it that way. Um, so I think if I was them, I would look at other long lasting IPs and how we're going to do it. But um, I, I just, I'm like, if you want to have it gone forever, but hey, people still like peanuts. So if you can do the peanuts thing. Sure, but I, I would look at, like, I would be very wary because, you know, world events can change certain things. So we'll see. Um, in better, cooler news, and I will give them credit for this because this is on both accounts, on both people. Wait, hold up. What? I just clicked on this deadline link, and I have a story after this. I'm, I'm going to react to it live because that's pretty crazy. But, um... So, um, Martin Scorsese and Seth MacFarlane, who both have, I believe, film foundations. Uh, Martin Scorsese's film foundation is partnering with the Seth MacFarlane Foundation to fund the first ever curated restoration of historically significant animated shorts from the 1920s and 1940s. I bring this up because, um, although Kino has released animation things, um, Animation does not really get treated historically, film history wise, as well as live action film does. You have people like Tommy Stathis, who I made the documentary about a night at the Cartoon Carnival. You can check it out. It's on my YouTube channel. He does a good job. There's certain animation historians, but the, by and large, they don't do as much stuff. They're not as many gift sets. When I was putting away my DVDs, I was like, oh, the UPA box set I have. Like, I'm going to keep that. But I'm also like, yeah, because Criterion would not make a UPA box set. Because Criterion would not make a George Powell or a, a um, Fleischer Brothers set. So I will give them both credit uh, for doing this. Because this is fairly unprecedented in terms of film history to do a major restoration like this. What he's going to, they're going to be screened as part of the TCM thing. Um, but uh, we have seven shorts directed by Dave Fleischer. Those will be Coco's Tattoo, Little Nobody, The Little Stranger. Greedy Humpty Dumpty, Peeping Penguins, The Fresh Vegetable Mystery, and So Does an Automobile, as well as The Three Bears, A Terry Tunes, directed by Manny Davis, and Two Gun Rusty, A George Pal Puppet Tune, all things that need to be restored, and I want to thank them for doing that. I think that's actually amazing. Like, I'm not joking around. That's that's something we don't get enough of presently. Um, so this has just broken. I want to say this. Um, this is the news that I was free, freaking out about. Uh, the Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, a uh, constant runner-up for the movie review vote, didn't win, and then got taken out. I forgot if the person stopped being a patron or they picked a different movie. I forget now. Um, but uh, apparently Terrence Stamp, Guy Pierce, and Hugo Weaven are back on board 30 years after for a Priscilla sequel. I don't think that sounds like a 
good idea to me, but I hope it works out. I'll probably end up seeing it. I'm sure I will. All right. So, um, next up. So, remember the yesterday lawsuit where these two guys, I think it was two guys, the greatest simps of all time, um, decided to sue a studio for their trailers because in the trailer it had Ana de Armas, but in the movie it didn't. But I argue the movie was called Yesterday. About it. Everyone can remember. You can't remember the Beatles, but they can. Maybe that was the point ultimately, which I would have argued if they were, if I was their lawyer, that's the point is like they're parts of the trailer. So you, then you actually experience while you're watching the movie that you remember something that the movie doesn't, but whatever. Um, these guys also sued people because Anna de Armas wasn't in a movie. So, you know, probably not the smartest people in the world. But um, so Anna de Armas does not appear. Apparently the reason she was cut is because um, they... Uh, apparently she was cut because she was going to be a love interest or something and um they felt that that was hurting the story so they cut her story out and it's just like him uh after the school teacher girl or something like that um even though in reality he would have like he would have just hooked up with Anna Darmus. let's be real here but um the initial ruling found that the studios could be held liable for false advertising based on the contents of trailers but according to variety various setbacks followed leaving the men on the hook for $126,000, no, I'm sorry, $126,705 for Universal's legal fees. As a result, the side settled their dispute last weekend. I'm going to be honest, if someone sued me for false advertising, it was like, but I, because of weird legal rulings, I have to pay for your legal fees. I probably would have been way meaner because like, this is the dumbest lawsuit alive. But apparently Universal was cool about it and it, the settlement was not disclosed. It was probably like, don't sue us again. You're weird. Uh, <laughs> but I love it. Like this went to such a point that they were going to have to pay like upwards of like a, a shit ton of money, like more money than a lot of people make in a year to Universal because they fucked around and found out like what? I don't know. Part of me is like, I think... You were the dumb ones who wanted to do this lawsuit that people had to take seriously. Anyway. Um, I think I did say hi to you. But if I didn't, Austin, I apologize. Hey, Austin, how's it going? I thought I did. Maybe because you weren't there. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but uh, here, I will cheers to you. Oh, let's see. Austin says, did Jim both miss saying hi to me and still haven't talked about AI James Dean or that new horror movie, Stop Motion? I like that Stop Motion will never die. Cheers to you, Austin. I did see, I don't think I talked about it on stream that one of the Red Letter Media guys um, saw it and liked it. So that was cool. I'm, I'm glad that that happened. All right. So to complete the thumbnail trifecta, Keanu Reeves is cast as Shadow uh, in Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Um, I think this is a smart move. Um, for Keanu, it's like John Wick is, I, I guess, over? Is it over? I don't, I'm confused. Uh, I mean, he like died, so, but it's, they keep talking about a fifth one, so I don't know. However, um, it seems like he is still a major star. He doesn't do a ton of stuff, but I think this would probably be a cool move for him. I also should add another thing about Sonic. Um, uh, with, with this is like parents like taking their kids, like parents like taking their kids to Mario. And if parents like, oh, cool, Keanu's in this, it gives you an extra reason. I, th I think that sort of works out. I am kind of curious if the public will embrace, um, sorry, will embrace um it was jay okay uh the other sonic characters because i know i know people in the chat and i'm not like trying to be shitty or something um uh like all that stuff but the general public to them it's like sonic tails knuckles that's it so i am i think this one the health of the franchise going into like all the other characters that um like my daughter likes some of those and stuff I think that will uh, play into that quite a bit. I think it's a smart move because uh, he was really great as Duke Kaboom. Um, I also think it's smart because it's a kid's thing. It's like something he can do 
to appeal to a new generation. Um, the parents who are buying the tickets will be hyped. I think it's like a smart move. It's a, it's a total smart move. He might even do, like, I mean, Knuckles is having his Paramount Plus show soon. I'd really be curious um, if uh, Shadow has some sort of Paramount Plus thing. They probably worked that out in his deal or something like that. So I think it's, a, and I'm sure Keanu's like, I just do some voices and stuff like that. So maybe he'll come back for Toy Story 5. Whatever. All right. Anyway, Austin says, will Olive Garden be in this? Of course, Olive Garden will be in this. And wasn't Zillow? <laughs> God. I'm curious what's going to be in Knuckles. I like how in Knuckles, it's like all the ads are like, it's everyone, but not James Marsden. Like, it's like very, <laughs> it's very clear. Although he was in Jury Duty. He can fucking do Knuckles. Jury Duty was good. All right. Cheers. I miss Kevin James YouTube videos too. Cheers to you, Austin. Thank you. Um, all right, so it was announced that there's going to be a live-action One Punch Man movie. One of the writers in it will be Dan Harmon. And I do think when you first say that, you're like, oh, that's... And then you think about it, and you're like, I don't know if I like that. I think Dan Harmon is, or was, a good writer. I have not seen his Fox show at all. Um, but I think he, thing with One Punch Man is I think the beginning of season one was excellent. And as it went on, I, I do think like the beginning few episodes could make a cool movie, but I don't think you need to do too much to it, you know, just like make it cohesive as a film. But I, I just don't think, um, I think it's a bad idea. I, I just, I, I don't. I also think with One Punch Man, it's like, even with the people I like anime, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, season one was really good. But I just like, to me, it's like, if I was investing in that IP, I would be like, let's not spend too much because, like, people only seem to like the beginning of it. And, like, I think it could make a cool movie, but also part of me is like, what's the point? Because part of it is his blank animated face. And, like, I think Michael Sarah could actually play One Punch Man. But I just don't think Dan Harmon, like, I don't know, for a while I was like, why can't him and the uh, um, Venture Brothers guys write all the Marvel movies? Now I'm like, I'm kind of glad Dan Harmon isn't. However, I would like if uh, the Venture Brothers guys were brought into write Marvel movies. I think that's like, if I was running Marvel, I'd be like, get get Doc Hammer and Jackson Public in here. Like, let's, they can write the Fantastic Four movie. Like, that would be interesting to me. Um, but um, I don't know. I just don't think... I think this is a dumbass idea. And I also think, like, the live-action remake thing, like, people are so into it. Like, the normies I still actually like that shit. And I'm just like, don't do it, you know. I did like... One, this is a very much an aside thing, but uh, when Michael B. Jordan directed Creed Three, which I think, um, of all the movies people complained about getting sidelined by... The Jonathan Majors thing. I think that one was a major one. But uh, what people asked him about, like, his favorite animes and stuff, he was like, they were like, would you ever direct an anime movie? And he's like, no, those like a live action. And he's like, no, those never work. I don't want anything to do with that. And I was like, um, good for him. Good, good, good for, good for Michael B. He's like, he's like, like, likes anime enough. That he's like, I'm not selling out for fucking, <laughs> for that shit. Like, cool. I always like that about him. All right. Um, I've heard there's some that are good, but in general, I think it's a, unless you're Speed Racer or Pete, Pete's Dragon, you should just not, not do it at all. So, um, I'm going to talk about the two AI things sort of together. Um, I think we have a half hour before, uh, I should take a break and then we'll do the Space Ghost segment. Um, I'll talk more about like my reasoning behind it, but it's basically the first three pile. It's a thing. It's one segment. But I'm talking about three different things. It, it was in a tweet before. Anyway, um, so the AI stuff. Um, we had two things with AI this week. Um, we had the Netflix documentary. Now I'm forgetting, didn't write down what it's called. A Netflix true crime documentary. Um, crime AI. Um, 
uh, in what Jennifer did, apologies. And then uh, A24 used it for uh, new posters for the Civil War movie, which I don't fully understand why you would do that after it came out. Like, who does that for a poster? That's that's weird anyway. Um, the Netflix documentary, What Jennifer Did, is interesting because I believe a bunch of documentarians put out rules about using AI the same day. In fact, a few hours before it broke that they had done this. Um, the thing... I have had an issue with how true crime is for a while now because I feel like how true crime is now is far more about telling the story than actually helping the victims, helping the um, helping get it solved, stuff like that. When I was back when I back in my day, or back when what true crime really was was just unsolved mysteries and uh, America's Most Wanted, the 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 main thing for those shows was working with the detectives and the families and trying to find out a way so that they could help solve the murder or the mystery or whatever. And I don't think morally, uh, those shows are like hundred percent correct, but it is shocking. Like, you know, if you watch, I watch old unsolved mysteries all the time. And despite that, like, yes, they will like get weird about certain things. Um, I will say morally they're far in a better place than like true crime is now because like I, did say this on Twitter, but I'll bring it up again. Um, is that like, if you watch Unsolved Mysteries, they're very clear, like, this is a recreation. This isn't like, I don't know. It's not, it's not a real footage. Or if they recreate a piece of evidence, they're very clear about what they're doing. And there's a morality to that. Whereas if you're like making a documentary and you're not telling them you used AI, like you assume as a viewer that those are real photos and why wouldn't you because that's how it's being presented so i think like w what that says about people and creatives is like they're far more i hate using this term creative when i use it but they are far more interested in getting you into the story than they are ethically and morally telling it and i feel all these true crime people will say they're into ethics and morals but if you're into ethics and morals you would be like i actually worked with the detective because look i'm not a very pro cop person but I also do understand that if there's a murder investigation, that someone's son or dad or or wife or sister or something, and they're trying to solve it, and you fucking that up is uh, kind of shitty. Like, if it was your mom and somebody made like, oh, I would get some YouTube views, I don't know, that, that would kind of offend you. Uh, you'd be pretty upset if you're like, this investigation is hard and I am cooperating with them. And some random ass jamoke decides to make whatever bullshit because they, you know, want to be a storyteller. I, I think that's, I think that's crappy. Um, I think this is another example of that. Um, if you're going to use AI and you say in this documentary in this way and you say we used AI because there weren't any images but we wanted to express the point and they say that, I'm actually not against that because you were telling the audience what you did. And then I can make a choice. I can say like, oh, well, fuck them. They used AI. Or I can say, hey, at least they're admitting it. Um, they can, there's moral ways you can do these things, but it just seems like they're like, how can I save money at any fucking cost? Which sadly, AI happened right when Hollywood is tightening the belts. We're hearing about less production crews. We're hearing about less things being picked up. There, There's there's a real tightening of the belt happening at the around the same time as AI, which is... Uh, worrying because that sort of gives the um, uh, I, I think is going to give AI a lot of opportunities that otherwise shouldn't. Uh, the Civil War thing with A24 um, I think uh, I think A24 is not in a good place right now. Um, Bo is afraid is probably going to um, I wouldn't use, by the way, when I said if they use it, I think that's the most moral way to do it. I didn't read the documentary rules and stuff like that. I would not make something with AI. Um, I, right now, I really would be uncomfortable with it, even though it's like you see certain things, but it's like I, I really don't. Um, and I don't think you should use it. But I'm saying if you do and you acknowledge it, that at least gives the viewer the option to either turn off or understand what they're using in the full context, which I think those documentarians should have done. But like you should be understand the morals of the images you are presenting. And um, I don't know if you went to f a different film school or just like don't really care about humanity, which you'd be surprised how many people will make that, but whatever. 
Um, oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, Cornbread. Um, anyway, um, so A24 put out posters after the movie came out, which is, that is weird. I've never heard of a studio doing that. But, um, uh, you're, we're good, Cornbread. I'm sorry about that. Um, but the thing with A24 is that Bo is Afraid was a bomb. Um, they obviously know they need to make more money. Independent production, I was hearing this on the Ankler podcast. I've heard from other people. Independent production companies have a really hard time eventually because they want to make bigger movies that make more money. And this was their big swing this year. And it seems like they're going to do more action and stuff like that. And I do sort of feel like we're seeing the end of them being interesting and seeing a different A24. Civil War, I think they're able to sort of get away with it right now. But I'm curious what's on the horizon for them. I think this is a move more towards them like trying to be cost cutting and like keeping engagement going and stuff like that. But I think it was a tremendously bad move. And the fact that they're doing this now, I, I sort of am worried about where A24 is going. But I do feel like this is like the beginning of the end. Um, but I, I also think like we had way too much faith in that studio. Like people are like, I hate when I ask someone like, what do you like? And like, I like A24 movies. I'm like, that's a, what? Like, that's, I don't know. That's weirder than like, I'm like, oh, I like Disney. See, when people say I like Disney animated films, you're like, oh, a specific thing. It's like, I like A24 movies. And I'm, I'm always like, um, uh, that's not a genre, though. That's <laughs> it's like all sorts of things, you know. Um, William Elvin, I want to point this out because it's a smart thing. He says the same thing happened with Miramax, eventually independent studios, this move on. I want to say this. Uh, oh, A24 is the canon of our generation, clearly. It might be. I think that would be. And Cinderam saying the Miramax thing too. I've actually thought that for a while. Cheers to you, Zane Powers. But I was like, it's sort of hard to talk about now because Miramax means the Weinsteins. But back in the 90s, I like loved fucking Miramax. Like I, I, I remember I would get, if Miramax had a tape out, this is before the internet and you'd get like a new trailer like on Twitter so, like, the only way I could see some trailers was on these tapes. And it would be, like, 20 minutes of fucking trailers. And I would, like, eat that shit up. Like I was like, oh, man, Miramax makes, like, the smartest movies and stuff like that. But I do think um, believing in these indie studios like Janus or whatever, they don't really, like, I, I, I don't know. I think, like, really believing a studio is a good studio based on content is like a very strange thing to me like i i even you know i have issues on uh tour theory too but the, there, there's you know certain things but i do find the a24 thing odd and uh i do think you won't hear people saying i like what do you like oh i like a24 movies i i do i do not find that to be not to be a jerk but when people say it to me i was like oh okay you know it's not i i it's, it's a weird thing. Like, people say, oh, I like 90s crime movies. That's, like, a specific thing. But A24 is, like, so you just see, like, art house stuff, I guess? I don't... Anyway. It, and I did notice... I saw The People's Joker, which uh, another review that will come out soon. And in the theater, all the people were seeing uh, Civil War and, like, debating it. But it felt like they were debating it because they felt like they should because it's A24. Because I heard a bunch... I heard a few people make that comment. Um, and I just found that to be interesting. I'm, I think this transitional point with A24 is going to be a, I'm curious how we view A24 in a couple of years. So, um, we'll see. Uh, A24 has terrible servers and delivering marketing materials. I, well, clearly that is true because with the Civil War trailer. All right. Um, Canon felt, I would love if A24 became like a junky distributor. Wouldn't that be like amazing? Why do I have just written media? What? Is that supposed to mean something? Okay. Uh, sorry, it's in my script. I just wrote media. I don't know. Um, so, I want everyone to calm down because Zack Snyder has announced... This is a big thing, guys. Zack Snyder today announced that George Miller in Furiosa has announced that there is a 15-minute action sequence that took 200 stunt people 78 days to shoot. And it's very important for Anna Taylor Joy's character. Not only uh, that, but apparently she did not have her... 
her driver's license and can only do a J-turn. What does that mean? I still don't know. It was apparently starting with the capture of Warlord Dementus, Chris Hemsworth, and his biker horde. There's a biker horde? There's a biker horde in this movie, you guys. The new movie follows Furiosa's quest for fucking vengeance and attempts to reunite with her family in her homeland, which we know she probably doesn't do because that's on Fury Road. I mean, spoilers, but not. But, but, it is, it is, I remind you, 15 minute action sequence that they took 78 days to shoot. There are mumblecore movies that took shorter times to shoot and are way longer and will never be as good as that. That's right. I'm taking down fucking mumblecore. You didn't see that coming in this. Nobody, everybody, everybody calm down. I'm taking down mumblecore right now because Furios is going to be so good. It will literally erase a past fad in art house cinema that everyone forgot and no one's really sure why it was called it doesn't matter furiosa has a 15 minute action sequence so anyway um zach snyder is going to make a new cut of sucker punch do you remember that <laughs> sorry uh okay he's got a new cut of sucker punch the movie that you forgot we did okay but okay but how many stunt penguins were in happy feet Two J seven. Hello, two J seventy three. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Happy Feet is a wild movie. I finally saw it, and I was like, "Dude, what the fuck is this? A joy turn? What the fuck does that mean?" <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's to you, two J seventy three. Uh, did I say Shrek? <laughs> oh man. Wait. Hold on. Hold on. I, I know what I want to do now. One second. One second. Um, so Zack Snyder has said his next uh, cut is going to be of Sucker Punch, which many people feel is his... Um, is his, like... Uh, like, I don't know is his last like big original thing it's supposed to take down how women are sexualized in fandoms and stuff i always thought it was kind of just a ridiculous thing but we'll see i don't know he's gonna make a new one um in sadder news and this is actually kind of um sad is Catherine bigelow was trying to get a movie made at netflix netflix says they're going away from auteurs and moving more to audience movies which is interesting because uh most of their movies put me to fucking sleep but uh they <laughs> Really, I'm not seeing. I was like, I was like, that. What was there? Zack Snyder's movie that came out today on Netflix. I was like, I don't need to go to sleep after doing a ton of dishes. The fuck you doing out right now? Like you should have come out during Easter, bro. Um, the only turn Anna Taylor Joy can do. Rand Sandfeld, I applaud you. That is an epic dad joke. Um, but um, it's sad that Catherine Bigelow has been trying to get a movie made all this time and hasn't she made detroit which i actually didn't see to be honest with you um which that didn't do well um i the problem with Catherine bigelow ultimately and i agree with a few people have said this is that unlike a scorsese or a spielberg um sadly because all of the kind of heat she had off of hurt locker and zero dark 30 and being the first female to win best director is kind of gone that was a while ago so like any director who's like let's put all this stuff into Catherine Bigelow I I sort of think like a, one of the streamers should pick her up because she is a really good action director but it does suck that like they can remake point point break point break right point break they can remake one of her movies but not give her another movie is fucking bullshit so uh what will what about Zyner's six Rebel Moon sequels? I don't know if that's going to do that, but, uh, but hey, Nick Nitro, how's it going, man? It, it has been a couple years. I'm glad to see you. Nice to see you. Cheers to you, Zane Powers. All right. So um, we're going to do a bit of Marvel news. So um, this is just the Marvel news section. So remember how everyone's like, Sam Raimi is going to do Spider-Man 4, uh, or is in con consideration for Spider-Man 4. This story is about that, but not that Spider-Man 4. Ha-ha, <laughs> I tricked you, I guess. It's Tom Holland's 
uh, Spider-Man 4. Apparently they were actually considering Sam Raimi for a different Spider-Man 4. Not the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 4. The Tom Holland, which is like epically bizarre. That I was like, wait, so there was a different Spider-Man 4? Like Sam Raimi's the only guy in history who's been considered and not gotten two Spider-Man 4s and we don't even have a Spider-Man 4. Whatever. Uh, supposedly the people who are most Looks like, and I saw a bunch on Twitter today, but looks, a lot of people are saying it's going to be John Francis Daly from Freaks and Geeks and uh, something Goldenstein who directed D&D and Game Night and also did help write Homecoming, right? Homecoming? Yeah, Homecoming. So um, I think that could be cool. I think they would be a good choice because they've already written for the franchise um, as well as like Game Night and Dungeons and Dragons uh are highly quotable and i think that would actually be pretty cool to um uh you know have direct writer directors like that maybe they could do another trilogy and stuff like that but i think that could actually really work so um if it happens i hope it does the other thing this this is sort of some quick stuff by the way the avengers the new avengers people are saying is going to be directed someone who hasn't directed done a marvel movie before um so, you know, definitely the ghost of Igmar Bergman is directing the Avengers Kang Dynasty or Secret Wars. I mean, the ghost of Igmar Bergman hasn't directed anything other than, as we all know, Megan. But, I mean, ghost directed. See what I did there? Um, he, he's a ghost. He, anyway, uh, Blade apparently is just Blade and Vampires. Which it took them five years to figure out that a Blade movie should just be him fighting vampires. So, um, the MCU is doing great right now, you guys. Just doing great. Uh, and apparently Norrin Rad will show up as Silver Surfer. Um, so maybe Lakeith Stanfield posting, uh, that I thought I was Silver Surfer might be not as off as it is, but supposedly Fantastic Four takes place in a different mcu um so uh or a different universe so the keith could actually be norn rad is probably still silver surfer in the mcu universe as we know it and then shallow bow is silver Surfer in a different universe or something like that anyway it's confusing um x-men 97 uh we keep hearing people wanting Bo de mayo to make the movie or something like that I'm going to say one thing. We don't know what Bo DeMeo was canceled for. So everybody, please stop pushing this guy. Like, I'm just like, I'm begging everyone. Like, like until we find out what he did, I'm just, I'm just sitting here like, like his statement he did with episode five. I'm totally okay with that. He wants to art, but it's like, don't be like, man, he should be running all of the world and Marvel and stuff. And I'm just like, I don't. We don't really know what happened. So, like, until I do, I'm a little uncomfortable. Because I don't want to be... I do think he did a good job on X-Men 97. But I am a little nervous. Um, anyway. But he... Okay, Austin. Uh, but he... Uh, he... Uh, a lot of people think he sh they should do a movie. My hot take is, I think X-Men shouldn't be a movie. I think it should be a show. I think X-Men Animated is better than the Fox series. I think it's better than the reboot series. I, I think it is the best that X-Men can do. And X-Men is more serialized and everything like that. I do not think, uh, I, I just don't think X-Men as a movie is as good of an idea as a show. And also X-Men can sort of be its own thing. It's got so much universe. It's like its own universe. Like why put it in the MCU anyway? Anyway. Um, so uh, we also learned that uh, something we keep seeing... Oh, thank you, Ranger of the East. I, I don't know if I've seen you before, but I love you too. Uh, Melissa Barrera wants to do Scary Movie 6. I think that is awesome. We're seeing a big push to parody comedies. Paramount is making Naked Gun and uh, Scary Movie. So that's actually two. Um, and we're seeing uh, a lot of people are asking for like big laugh out loud comedies. I keep hearing from uh, pitches and stuff like that. So I think... No, it's okay, Austin. I think... Uh, I think we're going to see a bigger push for comedies uh, and probably see more of them in 2025. Seems to be where the industry is going in general. So, um, so this is probably, um, we should wrap up soon. 
and do other things. Trailers. So there's an old boy TV show. Um, it's developed by, by Park Chan Wook. I think that's how you say his name, who obviously directed Old Boy and did other stuff. And uh, looking at his statement on, here's a quote here. Sorry, just want to read it about why he chose to make an old boy show, which I'm sure your movie sucks will say very appropriate things about when it comes out. He said, hold on, the quote is Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> Prequel Furiosa has a 15 minute action sequence that took 200 stunt people 78 days to shoot. And it's very important to understanding Anna Charlie Joy's character of Furiosa. George and I would have big conversations about why this particular set piece was so long, says Taylor Joy, who still doesn't have a driver's license despite learning to do a J turn, which apparently is a joy turn, according to Ran San Film. On her first day of stunt school, she did this. <laughs> And that's very important for understanding how resolution of Furiosa is, but also her grit. It's the longest sequence any of us have ever shot. The longest sequence that George Miller has ever shot. Can you believe this shit? Uh, everybody got a stairway to nowhere wine. What is that? What's stairway to nowhere? I need to drink this wine. This is amazing. There isn't cinema until we get Furiosa. All of cinema needs to stop until we get Furiosa. Anyway, so there's going to be an old boy show and Park Chan-wook is involved in making it. Sounds like a dumbass idea. Good luck to him. We should stop remaking old boy. Anyway. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, we're gonna... <laughs> I actually today I was like I should just repeat this a lot cuz I just want to keep reading this article. It's amazing. There's going to be a there was a debate in the Discord about if I would know what golden golden axe was. Even though I'm pretty sure uh, I'm the only one who played it when it originally came out. Maybe. Oh, man. That was that was amazing. Um, I don't know. What what is what it William Elman? What is that? Um, um, OK. Uh, so apparently the Golden Axe, which is a video game for classic Genesis, is going to be getting a uh kind of a 10 episode animated series uh it's going to be kind of a funny version of like a parody sort of version uh danny pudi is going to be in it michael reese lisa gilroy just says from jury duty i'm not sure who she is but that actually sounds like a cool idea i know they did that fox show with like the he-man type guy um and stuff but i think this could actually be cool because it's sort of like a thing like when i heard it i sort of remembered it but i don't think anyone's gonna get that upset i'm sure midnight's edge is preparing the video now how could you make fun of our precious golden axe this is real men talking and they just did that to humiliate us men or something and it'll be a thing so if they, if they do that i wrote the video i deserve to be paid for that all right um let's do uh i should probably uh finish up in a little bit so let's just do trailers and um yeah sorry um so uh oh a tidy cat oh okay um one thing is i saw the casting for superman and i actually like the parents um oh a tiny car nice uh uh, the parent casting was actually of the Kents was actually really cool. I think because Man of Steel did the casting, the past star casting that Superman the movie or Richard Donner Superman did with Glenn Ford and then they did Kevin Costner. I think it's a smarter move to actually make them look like actual parents nowadays. I was like, oh, those look like parents. I don't, I don't know. They both look like they went to a Pearl Jam concert. And so if you did, your kids are probably in your 20s or 30s. So that, that tracks. Um, there was also a teaser for My Adventures of Superman. I'm very excited for that show to come back. To me, it looked like Supergirl in that little teaser. We don't have a release date. I hope it comes out soon. I think that is such a great show. I think, actually, if I was James Gunn, I would be most worried about that. I'd be watching that show like, fuck, dude. Like, how are you going to... I think that would be the hardest one. Um, we got the trailer for Trap which is the new M. Night Shyamalan film that has an amazing premise where um, a serial killer it comes to a concert with his daughter um, and he finds out the whole concert is a trap to catch a serial killer, which they believe is him. Some people have thought there's a twist to it because it's Shyamalan that like maybe the girl's the killer. I've actually thought, what if 
he's not the serial killer they're catching and he just thinks there is. I've thought of that. There was this part in, um, if anyone is going to get this reference, it's uh, Sinram. Sorry to call you out. I think it's like City of something. It's like an Al Pacino movie. I think Alan Bernstein's in it. And the opening has like all these guys show up and they're like, oh, you're here to get a flyer for free Yankees tickets. And they're all criminals and they arrested like a hundred people. Supposedly this happened to some degree. Um, but I always remember that opening sequence. And then at the end of the sequence, this guy shows up with his kid. He goes, oh, where are the free Yankees tickets? And they see him like with his kid. And Al Pacino uh, is like, um, is like, sorry, kid. Uh, I guess we, we ran out of them. And they drive away because he doesn't want to arrest him in front of his son. Um, what was that? My friend showed it to me and he goes, that's how you know Al Pacino is a good guy. He wouldn't arrest him in front of his son. I remember remember that. Um, it's a good movie. I'll look it up later. Sorry. Uh, we also got the trail. But anyway, Trap looks like a cool thing. Uh, there's some controversy or people shit talking. M. Night having his daughter do the singing. Um, uh, I'm like, whatever. Uh, it looks it looks fun. It looks fun. Back to the Josh Hart netissance. Um we also got the Hitman trailer. There's a lot of hype around this Richard Linkletter film with Glenn uh, Powell, with Glenn, whatever his name is. Uh, the trailer looks like a lot of fun. I sort of get why people are into it. Um, is that all the trailers? Oh, maybe that's it. All right, so the last two things before we do obits. Um, I might even do a short thing about how Clara Bow, there's a Taylor Swift song named Clara Bow. Um, as I don't really talk about Taylor, my daughter loves Taylor Swift, and I listen to her occasionally and stuff, but... I thought it was really cool that uh, she named a song Clara Bow because um, a lot of people, particularly you must you must remember this um, with Karina Longworth and several people brought up when Madonna did the Vogue thing where she named a bunch of movie stars that made a lot of people go and seek out each of those movie stars. So I think there's a lot of people who are probably going to go find out who Clara Bow is. Um, and that's awesome, especially a silent film star. I actually thought the album's like, okay, but like the fact that Clara Bow's mentioned and people will go seek out a Clara Bow movie. I posted it. It's on Tubi. Um, it's a movie called It that came out before Stephen King wrote the book. So uh, Stephen King. City, sea of Love. Is that it? I think you're right, William Elman. Thank you. Um, uh, that's a really good one. So I highly suggest. Um, it's it's That's the one to understand her as a star. She was also in Wings. She was the biggest star in Wings. But Wings is about two dudes. And she is a part of it, but I don't think she's the focus as much. If you if you need if that's your reason for seeing Wings, do it. But if you want to understand her as a star, see uh, it, which is on Tubi presently. I don't know what Wings is on actually. Um, the other things, and uh, well, I'll spend a little time. Maybe we'll go over tonight. Um, Andy Merrill, uh, seeing him on Twitter and talking about life, I think it sucks to see what's happened to what. Adult Swim's done to their legacy stars. See, see Martin Croker when he, um, I believe it when he, um, uh, he passed away, correct? Am I wrong about that? Yes. So when he passed away and how he was being treated and things like that, it's sad. And apparently, uh, Andy Merrill was almost a host for the cartoons thing on MeTV, but it fell apart. Um, and he's just sort of struggling to get by. That's like one of the things about the arts that's been hitting me. Uh, as someone who makes stuff and, you know, it's always a struggle to like keep the lights on and everything. Uh, uh, the, here, uh, the Jonah Ray thing hit me more for some reason. Um, even though I, I don't have a huge attachment necessarily. But hearing about Annie Merrill and Steve Martin Kroger, it does feel like... Um, in some senses, it doesn't get any easier to make stuff. Um, or even like the guy who's um, Frylock, you know, he has a hard time getting into conven conventions sometimes. Like it's just the disrespect to some of these people, I think, is not just from adults. I think it's from all the people like they're not getting enough opportunities. It just it's tough. It's very tough field. And um, I feel bad that it's anywhere. I wish I could help him in some way i'm too small of a person but i just think um i don't know it stinks i hope i hope things work out for him in some ways um it seems like he likes he was getting more attention recently on twitter and that's good if he has a patron or something um as much as i guess people would say don't talk about other people's things i would actually say support him i want andy merrill to succeed i want all those guys to succeed 
but it sucks like these people who inspired me so much when i was growing up like you think like they would be much more comfortable and it just uh it just sucks i i i I don't think there's any other way to say it. It just it just sucks seeing some of these people who you thought of as gods not being treated um, as such. So um, the other thing, and I did want to talk about this before we do obits. Um, I saw that I'm part of like a Regal Unlimited Facebook group, and they talked about how Regal is really doing the bare minimum of screening screening times and staffing. And I've seen this with other theaters as well. If the weekend box office isn't great. And a lot of them, and this Regal, this is supposedly a representative who was on the Regal group who mainly got mad at the people because they really like these regulator cups and popcorn buckets that you can bring and just get a refill for free or for 50 cents, which is like mainly the Regal Unlimited people who are on the Facebook group. But um, he, uh, uh, he, he basically said that the whole industry is sort of working on bare minimum stuff until the fall guy which this this the film industry has so much emphasis on the fall guy at this point it is kind of insane like i was like this movie better be decent because like everything's like i saw I heard universal like we're gonna do a stunt show there's all this emphasis on the fall guy and i'm just like uh like i hope this is good it feels like an emphasis of too much hype um to be honest with you it's not like furiosa All right. Furioso, which, as we all know, as we all know with Furiosa, Furiosa has the sound of buzzing bees can be heard. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. The bee, of course, flies anyway because bees don't care what humans think is impossible. Barry Benson. Barry is picking out a shirt. Yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. <laughs> oh, black and yellow. Let's shake it up a little. Janet Benson. Barry, breakfast is ready. Barry, coming. <laughs> Hang on a second. No, fuck that. Furiosa has a 15-minute action sequence that took 200 people, stunt people, 78 days to shoot. It is very important for understanding Anna Challenger's character. And sounds like the greatest thing ever. Cinema will enlighten. People will go like, what was the fall guy? Why did we believe in that? When we literally have a 15 minute action sequence that took 78 days to shoot with 200 people. Anyway, so Disney is going to make some new fast channels. Uh, basically like what Pluto does, but they'll have Star Wars and shit. It sounds stupid and it won't be as good. Uh, Zane Powers said, <laughs> uh, are you happy? <laughs> Are you happy at least Zaslav got a pay raise? I'm happy that I have more bun money to burn his house down with. Cheers to you, Zane Powers. All right, that was too far. I'm sorry. Um, let's... Uh... Sorry, that was... Okay, um, that was too much. Hope his house is okay. Um... Um... All right, so um, in Obits news, sorry, I need to get that out before we do the Obits. Uh, Eleanor Coppola, who is the mother of Sophia, and um, uh, who's the mother of Sophia and the wife of Francis Ford Coppola, and the director of um, uh, Hearts of Darkness, uh, died this past week. Um, I think Hearts of Darkness, and I think it was a book as well, is one of the great movies about movies ever. Um, um, and, uh, she's pretty much been an essential part of filmmaking in the past years, as well as Roman Coppola, sorry, um, a real legend of everything that has happened with that family. And I think kind of the glue that stuck a lot of that together probably deserves a lot more credit than she ever got. Um, if you've never seen Hearts of Darkness, see Hearts of Darkness. I know I'm constantly like, when I bring up the Coppola stuff, be like, I know people bring it up too much, but you should see the Coppola stuff. But that is a great documentary. As well as we found out that Warwick Davis's wife, Samantha Davis, died this past week. Um, and that's very sad. Warwick Davis and his kids and everything his daughter was in, The Willow Show, is an actor I've always loved and I'm uh, sorry to hear about that. All right, so I'm going to take a break. Um, we're going to talk about Space Ghosts. 
um, I'm going to talk about all three kind of attempts to do a first episode of Space Ghost. Um, it's sort of one segment that will later be made a video. I will not talk about Furiosa during it. But one of the reasons is because Andy Merrill was the first voice of Space Ghost in the first pilot. So I read that and sort of took me down this research thing. And I thought, you know, it would be a cool video. Um, but I'll bring up all those things when I'm back. Um, oh, wait, I should bring up Ace Lynn Rider, whose links you should definitely uh, check out. Um, hold on, is this the right one? Yes, it is. You can look at Ace the Windrider's awesome thumbnail of uh, GIF thingy or whatever. Um, and uh, I will be right back after a quick bathroom break. We'll do Space Ghost and then we'll go do questions and then we'll all peace out. Okay, I think we'll run a little long tonight. Anyway, I will be right back.
Okay, hello everyone. Embuds, he has all these redacted messages? What's that about? Um, all right. Let me, wait. Hello, welcome back. All right, so this, <laughs> we're gonna do, um, wait, where's my, okay. So I want to, where's Twitter? Um, I want to give a shout out to a video before I start this segment because I feel like it indirectly um, um, sort of helped with this video, um, but they made, this one says Stay, Stay Up Late Productions made a video called Space Ghost Coast to Coast Lost Pilot Episodes. I will talk about those. Um, I will talk about those, but um, at the same time, this is a different thing because I'm talking about the whole development process and stuff like that. But I recommend if you want to know more about the Lost Links, you check out that video um, and all that stuff. Um, but anyway, let me drink some water. All right. So, hold on, where is, okay. So, um, this past week, it was the 30th anniversary of Space Ghost, Coast to Coast. And I thought, since this is the 30th anniversary, I had a lot of options of episodes I could talk about. I wanted to talk about the development process of Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, going from the three pilots that they made, the or two pilots, and then the first episode, and how the show eventually formed to what it was uh, using these three things um, because I actually find it kind of interesting and then when you eventually watch the first episode you're a little like how the fuck did we get here and it's sort of an interesting story in my mind so um, again since I feel like I might cut out the other part I do recommend if you want to watch more watching the Space Ghost Coast to Coast Lost episodes uh, Lost Pilot episodes thing from Stay Up Late Productions that will be linked in the description below for all of you guys in the chat i will post this in the chat right now um i'm just i i don't want it to be construed as me ripping this person off because i think i'm doing a different thing but i i also am aware that they did a similar thing for the anniversary of space ghost so i just want to be 100 percent on that um because i don't like to you know i'm sure he worked hard on their video as well um Primal Screens is shutting down. I don't understand. Um, all right. Have a good night, Dan. Thank you for being here. Um, so the first attempt at Space Ghost was actually with Andy Merrill, who we talked about, or the voice of Brack, who was a writer on Space Ghost as well. But um, as him as Space Ghost, um, this, uh, and it was just Space Ghost clips and his voice over it. I don't think the lips really matched, sort of, if you kind of get your brain to uh, interviewing clips from Denzel Washington. Um, they were going to like air this in some degree, but apparently to use the footage of Denzel Washington, it would have cost them like $20,000, which is probably more um, more money than Space Ghost cost at the time. So um, they couldn't actually use it. They did recreate this. It's on the Volume 2 DVD. I forget if I have that one, but you could find it on the Internet Archive of the Andy Merrill pilot. You sort of get the vibe of... A little bit of Space Ghost. It's just Space Ghost. There's no Zorak or Moltar. It's not too crazy. And I also think kind of the problem and probably what they realized is like I've heard Denzel here tell those stories before in other interviews. It's not really good stories for like making fun of someone. It's just sort of like good anecdotes and Space Ghost. The joke is that Space Ghost is interviewing them. And I think Space Ghost to Coast was actually more than just that it, it there were jokes and there was funny there um so i think like uh they probably came to that and realized one they can't use footage that cost twenty thousand dollars and two had to figure out a better way to use it they made a second pilot now this pilot is actually lost and this pilot i think gets into a sort of criticism when space ghost, ghost, ghost came out but that gary owens who is the voice of the original space ghost from the show uh was was the voice of space ghost in this one and he interviews emma thompson and chris gore 
from Film Threat. I sort of wish Chris Gore wasn't involved in this because he's a little cringy, but um, or is total cringe. Um, but <laughs> but um, apparently, since we've never seen it, it's lost. We've seen some pictures, which when this is a separate thing will be up now. Um, it's lost and we've never seen it, but it's supposed to be a coming soon style interview show. I can't imagine Gary Owens did a great job. We haven't seen it. And I don't know what the humor was like. I have no indication that uh, uh, Zorak and Moltar are in this at all, which is another thing. Um, I, I also am like not sure. It seems like sort of the format of what would happen in the actual first episode. But we don't know anything. I don't know why they won't air this. I'm not sure if like Gary Owens is just really bad. Um, but uh, I, I, I am curious... Uh, what this would have been a criticism when space ghost coast to coast came out because i was in comic book stores and the few comic conventions i went to was that they were forgetting about the legacy of the space ghost cartoon like there were a lot more people about it since there was barely an internet then there was no twitter complaining like not my space ghost or something like that if it happened now i'm sure those people would be a lot more vocal but there were people who were upset about it so had they known about this i'm curious what their reaction would be um how much money does... Oh, nice. Uh, good night, Rand Samfield. Thank you for being here. It's been a while. I'm glad you're here. Um, so it's kind of interesting that the original voice of Space Ghost was on this. Um, I know people like Alex Toth, who designed Space Ghost, I don't think is a fan of Coast to Coast, from my understanding. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that they actually did try to do it with the original voice of Space Ghost. But then we get the actual first episode of Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, called Spanish Translation. And the other ones are sort of, dan or at least the first one that I could see. Um, and someone, so Cornbread mentioned they edited in the Denzel clips. I was wondering if you could find those interviews. So, okay, I was, in my head, I was like, I should do that. But now they've learned someone does. I'll try to uh, track that down possibly. But anyway, um, the Spanish translation episode, you know, those were kind of like interview style formats. This is, uh, the first episode is a lot of stuff happening at once and it's like almost like too crazy and frenetic to like take in like i forgot how much is going on first off they have these random stops of a spanish translation of something which doesn't make any sense like this is the extreme dadaism of space coast coast to coast is on display in the actual first episode it's interesting how it, it almost like sets up the show too much like it's it's crazy when a first episode is a little more chaotic than the actual show which is saying something with space goes but just in this first episode we have an mst3k segment we have uh spanish tr translations of stuff for some reason uh we also have space goes like it cuts to him like within a tv why i don't know it doesn't fit the show um uh there's a bunch of breaks of watching uh, oh there's a bunch of bracks watching space ghost and then doing a beefs and butthead impression Z zorak and multar have like a, a, a an album they're pushing at the same time and all of this is happening at the same time of uh two guests which is a uh, susan powter which um does make a random trans joke which is like kind of an aside thing but i did I, I don't really know who she is i had to look her up i sort of remember her being around but i don't remember her show um, other than that trans joke that she chose to make for some reason, um, which is in terms of the nineties, not the worst, that, no, it's the worst amount of trans joke, but not great at all. Um, she didn't, I don't know. She didn't, that didn't make me really like her that much. Um, but we also get appearances from, uh, Kevin Meany, um, and the Bee Gees who all seem to be like kind of game for the whole space ghost thing. I, I thought the first season had more like people, who were um, were unaware of what they were doing, but I guess maybe I'm I'm misremembering. Uh, this was a crazy episode. Uh, the MST3K thing is interesting because I believe Joel Hodgson worked on developing it and wrote a few episodes and then appeared on it. Um, so that's odd. Uh, it is them like they do the seats thing and stuff and all that stuff. But um, this kind of shows me like they were developing it and developing it and then suddenly like just went like fucking nuts at the end and didn't nobody expected them uh, to do that. But I think um, the the first episode is really like such an improvement on the other pilot 
and such an understanding of the concept and that you needed to have more than just that space ghost was interviewing people and i think that's why like initially in 94 like even in the 90s like pretty soon after people were like this is a watershed moment this is changing animation there's all these things and i like i can kind of see it because it's so wild you're like what the hell am i watching and even though i've seen this episode a million and one times i think um that first episode really is is a trip man it is it is pretty wild so i appreciate that they realized they had to throw everything at the wall but it does it in such an insane way sometimes i'm like what is going on but it's like also like i can tell why i liked it so much so it's interesting to see where they went from just andy merrill doing space ghosts just doing a regular interview to the craziness that was this but sometimes the development process takes you in crazy ways and it's crazy to see where space ghosts ended up to becoming the show that it was all right so um we should probably do questions let me write um hold on let me give me a second let me just write questions below let me do that um oh <laughs> I can't believe that. Uh, okay, Sinram said, Jim, you should know that Furiosa will have a 50 minute action set piece, which utilized 200 stuff people. It took 70 days to shoot, just an FYI. I love that. <laughs> I did that bit, and right after Sinram did that. <laughs> Cheers to you, Sinram. Thank you for. I, was, I thought someone would do that before. <laughs> I did it. Cheers to you, Sinram. You guys should see this movie, Stop Motion. The trailer is really cool. All right, um, hold on. Let me write questions below. Okay. Um, where were we? Why is that still there? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's do the Patreon questions. First, we have one from the Thanophobia. that says, what's an anime you think you could trans... What's an anime you think could actually translate well to a live action adaptation uh oh man the thing to focus i feel like i set myself up there i didn't actually you can tell i didn't read these questions beforehand um i actually think someone could do a good loop on if you got the right director but um i don't i don't know it would have to be a really it would have to be like spielberg 10 10 level like if spielberg did a loop on i think that could actually work uh, Sinram asks, I hear tell that Coppola's new film Megalopolis will screen at Cannes. This may attract a distributor as it currently has none. That is true. Which studio do you feel would handle it best given what you know about the movie so far? Bear in mind that Sony is thinking about acquiring Paramount. BTW, sorry, I pretty much missed the show last week, but I'm very glad you enjoyed my Patreon non-question. Um, <laughs> I did. Uh, I would say, um, I, despite all the things i think warners would do okay with it um the parent who knows who's going to buy paramount at this point it seems fairly unreliable so i actually i'm not going to poo-poo the um paramount thing to be honest with you uh i actually think like uh apple because apple can lose that money and it's not a big deal i think i think apple would be the best option and then apple does a deal with paramount much like how killers of flower moon was uh, and Austin, I was, I like doing Austin last, sorry. Uh, Austin, what rip and roaring show we had tonight. We learned that you were going to star in the Tarantino's last movie, the story of how you rescued the Dark City DVD and how you traveled back into the past to save both Gene Kelly and the X-Men. My question for you is who do you want to see direct the next Spider-Man Tom Holland movie? Um, I'm, I'm okay with John Francis Daly and golden scene i think that would actually be cool however um if i'm going to pick somebody um uh um huh that'd be that'd be i think that's a hard one uh to be honest with you i was gonna pick someone um just to uh, I don't know, actually. But 
I think the problem is it's hard because you have to have someone who's funny and good at doing the funny stuff, but also good at doing the dramatic stuff. I wouldn't mind if it was Sam Raimi to be honest with you, but um, I think those guys would actually be good, but I feel like I should have a better answer. Um, so I don't... <laughs> huh. I don't know. I wouldn't mind if it was like Maybe one of the, the director who directed a lot of Abbott Elementary. I think that would actually be good. Um, yeah, I mean, I forget his name, but he did a lot of season one. I thought I thought he deserved a little more credit. It was the people behind um, Jury Duty. I would want somebody like completely sort of different. Action movie wise, I I don't want a David Leach Spider Man or something like that, or like the John Wick guys. I think it should be somebody who's more based on like character and stuff like that. Um, Zane Powers is every single actor in Hollywood a shallow, vain, narcissistic, egomaniac who only ever do things that make themselves look good, no exception. Uh, probably someone. What's a hairstyle you'd love to be able to pull off? Not plausible. Um, I guess like a high top. I don't think I could do that. Um, oh, oh, we got a we got a question here from uh, Ashley R. Oh, thank you for that. Headed to bed. Thanks for the Friday stream. Oh, well, thank you very much. And thank you for your generosity. Big drink to you and have a good night. Thank you very much. Cheers. Very big cheers to you. It's very awesome of you and have a good night's sleep. Um, that is amazing. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, question, Super Dusky. So, do you just remember the B movie script? No, I looked it up. I looked it up. I just, it just occurred to me it would be funny because I did that B movie video forever ago. Um, that was really nice, actually. Art, thank you for doing that. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone who is here tonight. I really appreciate it. By the way, um, let's see. Where were we? Uh, Black Sox, Michael. Which character should Kevin James play in the MCU? You know what? I'm, I'm not joking. He would be a decent thing. Uh, oh, sorry, Card Red. That people got to the question. All right. Uh, I wrote it, but it's okay. Uh, you ever heard of this Furiosa fight sequence? I heard it's got a J turn. No, the, okay, to be clear on this, the sequence doesn't have a J turn. Anna Taylor Joy can do a J turn. Those are completely different. Whether she does in the movie, that we don't know. So we'll see. Um, oh, same powers. If Matthew Broderick could keep acting after he got found not guilty of his crime, why was the world robbed of OJ's continuing acting career? Or would you have wanted to come back? Um, I I don't I I don't think I don't think OJ. Um, was gonna get to make a comeback. I don't think that was that was a thing that happened. Although I did hear a lot of people who were young at the time. I do remember people like, like, um, because you know I was a kid in elementary school. I was like, why is the guy from the Naked Gun movies? What's going on? Like that was how we knew him because that's what we saw him for. I didn't know the Hurts thing, or I didn't. We didn't really watch football in my town at the time, so it was kind of funny. When you're a kid, you're like, yeah, the, na the guy from the Naked Gun movies. So that was how he knows. Uh, Austin, did you have pizza today? I actually did. So there we go. Uh, Cornbread, did you know the original 60s Little Shop of Horrors was released in just three days and shot in two, which, fun fact, is 73 days less <laughs> than it took to shoot the 15-minute action sequence in Furiosa. So what you're saying is the 15-minute action sequence is... 73 times better than the original Little Shop of Horrors. You know what? I will, I'm I'm going to quote you on that, uh, Cord Red. Will, William Elman, did you think that future Neon and Focus releases will rise in mainstream popularity and Oscar nominations as A24 tramps it to more of a mid-budget movie company? Um, probably. Also Searchlight. I would put Searchlight in there. But yeah, I would, I, Neon especially. I mean, the funny thing is, is we actually need more mid-budget stuff. So it might actually, the way you phrase it that way makes me think possibly that it would work out for them. But um, yeah, I, I could see that happening. Shane Foga, favorite Space Ghost guest, Michael Stipe. That was the first one I really fell in love with. Uh, Thom York and, or Thom Yorky as I call him. And Bjork, that one's great. Conan O'Brien was great. Um, I considered, someone in suggestions considered Fire Ants. And I thought about that one. 
Um, there's a bunch. The Metallica episodes are actually good. The Ramones episodes. Um, obviously, I'm going to say Joel Hodgson. So Joel Hodgson, I think, is the only Mystery Science Theater host to be on Space Coast. Unless Jonah Ray or Emily was. I don't think Mike was. He should have been. Uh, how do you feel about limited time candy bars? I think it sort of stinks, but it's always fun. It's kind of fun, I think that. St. Powers, I think the media note you were confused by was the stuff with Target and their physical media. That sounds right. Uh, I wasn't going to talk about that, but I heard apparently that's not true. But also, Target's weird. Like, I don't know. Uh, will you invest in the a- the film company A25? Sure. Why not? Question. Nathana Fogo, which Jesus film do you think will release first? Scorsese's or Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ Resurrection? <laughs> Why not put them out on the same day? That's... With uh, put him out against Transformers One and Wild Robot, uh, Zane Powers with Henry Kissinger dead. Jesus, Zane Powers, you're really going for it today. Uh, who has taken his place as the evil, immoral Ick King that refused to die? <laughs> I guess David Zaslav, maybe, or Trump, you know. But let's David Zaslav, Trump. They're like, no, Trump's worse than David Zaslav. Uh, and Blood T, what happens if Neon doesn't buy the distribution rights of a Palm Door winning movie this year? <laughs> You know, I, I'm surprised they wouldn't try to do the co. I think it, what people are really talking about is Kobo will have to just find anybody, and that m- might be something that happens with that, which would suck. Austin, when is FC Scat Cat come back? Uh, B. I hope, I hope soon. I like that guy. Didn't somebody make a video? Didn't Mars... Is he still around? Is that video still there? Didn't something happen? Anyway. Nathaniel Fogo, did you know My Spy is getting a sequel? What a wonderful world we live in. Is My Spy like the... I did not know about it. I heard you put... I didn't get to look up the whole thing with that. So I did I did see you wrote that, but I didn't get to do anything. I apologize. Uh, Zane, pa- Zane Powers. Sorry. Can you give me a non-ironic, legit pitch for why this era of entertainment is actually really good and the best there's been in decades um i think there's actually a lot of interesting independent stuff because i was actually thinking how the indie scene right now is and this year and i'm actually serious about this um although i really like stop motion i think most people didn't but i was thinking how the smaller movies i have seen uh this year actually were both interesting odd movies which was stop motion the people's joker and even hundreds of beavers which i haven't seen yet but i'm going to see like that's the indie scene right now like that's actually really cool like we're getting comedies and weird stuff i have actually a lot of faith in that right now um i'm wondering if it's just the season but i would like in a couple of years if like we get offbeat weird cult art house things which i think skinnamarink and even uh how to uh bomb a pipeline i think were kind of hinting at and i feel like we're getting more and more of those each year so that i actually do have some faith in, to be honest with you um Cornbread, will Dwayne The Rock Johnson take Woke out of Zoa Energy Drinks because he hates cancel culture? Whatever. I wrote this question four weeks ago and forgot to send it. Um, Maybe. I do I do worry about him with his A24 thing because I'm like, if it, I feel like he needs to get an Oscar nomination or he's going to like explode. Uh, question for Not Plausible. West Coast, Best Coast, or East Coast, Best Coast? I guess East Coast because I've never been to the West Coast, so I can't fully answer that question. Also, it's Illmatic's birthday. Illmatic turns 30 years old today, so I feel like I should say East Coast. Nathaniel Fogo, what would you, would you take kids to see Sonic 3? Yeah, I probably will. Uh, last question. I got a tournament for a card game, Toes. Can I have a good luck? Good luck, Austin. I hope it works out. Embla T, what happened to Annapurna and will that be the path A24 going soon? Um, I think they like, I forget, but something happened with them. But yeah, that, I don't know. I've heard a lot of people mention that um, independent production companies don't have the best thing. So I think that might be, um, they probably fell to the wayside, unfortunately. Um, Zane Powers, can you explain to me the Steven Spielberg owning the MLK speech and weaponizing the Holocaust. Uh, I don't know about all that, but yeah, he bought it from the estate actually. So he legally owns the rights at this point. Uh, Cornbread, do you feel spiritually connected to Brack because you both at one point had a sock pocket, sock puppet of your cartoon character? I didn't think about that, but true. Um, and T, what are your thoughts on James Gunn casting normal people's pawn market? I think I talked about that, but I think it's really cool. 
um, favorite movie food for food from a movie. Um, Panavision, maybe the the Big Kahuna Burger. I think about that. I think about eating burgers every time. Uh, question: When Robert Corman, when Roger Corman passes, will they officially release Fantastic Four? Probably not. I think that will be a sad day because all he brought to cinema. Uh, Zane Powers. Remember the time Red Letter Me. Red Letter Media argued that the company around the 2016 Ghostbusters movie was mostly artificially inflated by Sony. Oh, I I've heard that before, and I don't I don't think Sony paid AVGN or any of those people. I don't I don't believe that. What song are you listening to the most this week? I uh, I'm not sure. Um, Uh, Zane Powers, do you think copyright shouldn't exist or should exist in a far less extreme sense? Uh, far less extreme sense and be a lot loser. And last question, how often do you think about Zorak's nephew, Raymond? Oh, all the time. All the time. Uh, I didn't really talk about the Jorge Gutierrez thing because I didn't, there was too many things and I, I, I didn't want to do it disservice and it didn't seem like I knew enough about it and I didn't, anyway, I should have maybe talked about that. So, uh... I was making a what movie review? A Ted movie review. I did review both the Ted movies. I think you mean the show. I thought about reviewing the show, but I didn't. But I've reviewed both Ted movies um, previously, a long time ago. Um, all right. I think that is it. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you all very much for the Super Chats and your participation. Before you go, I would like to remind you that the Mad Max prequel Furiosa has a 15-minute action sequence that took 200 stunt people 78 days to shoot. And it's very important for understanding Anatella Joy's character. Um, Mad Max, the 15-minute sequence, uh, George Miller and I had a big conversation about the particular set piece so long, Anatella Joy said apparently she could do a J-turn on her first day of sun school because it's an accumulation of skills over the course of a battle that's very important to understanding how resourceful Furiosa is. All right, and that note, like the greater Gatsby, what? <laughs> all right, I think we did that bit enough. But thank you all for being here. It was a cool Friday night. I think next week it'll probably be a Thursday show, but uh, keep watch the social medias and stuff, and I will give you uh, an update on that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for everything. And I will see you all next time. Check out the videos and have a good night and subscribe if you would like to. All right, peace. Bye.